Welcome to the edge of the internet. Today we're going to be exploring the IPFS protocol uh, or interplanetary file system protocol. It has some wide ranging implications and effects on everything from not just sharing files, but also getting around censorship or, you know, with NFTs, with sharing files without having to rely on third party. So if that sounds like it's interesting to you, then follow along. To understand how IPFS works, we first got to understand how the traditional system functions. All right, so when you use, say, Dropbox, all right, uh, you're going to what ends up happening is you send your file to a bunch of servers, it uploads it, it stores it on. It's just like, you know, the saying that cloud is just somebody else's computer. And that's really what's happening. You're just storing the files in someone else's computer in exchange for typically a fee. Sometimes it's free. They store the files and then you can access them from your phone, from your computer. Uh, and it's what most of the internet is based off of. When most websites, all, almost all data you interact with most of the time, it's going to be hosted on a centralized server. Now, this is great for a lot of reasons, um, but the main drawback is that if the people running the server don't want you to have access to the files, maybe because of the government, uh, maybe maybe it's just an outage. You know, maybe the, they go, something happens to the data center. You know, whatever it is, um, you now no longer have access. All those files, all that data is now permanently deleted. What if you could create a system of instead of having to rely on third parties? Because essentially, especially if you have to, if you're sharing files, right? Um, say I have a new, dropped a new new song and I want my friend to to hear it. I could upload it to you know SoundCloud or Spotify, or what I could do is, and then and then he has to go and he downloads it from there, streams it from that resource, and then listens to it. What if we could just take out the middleman entirely, right? And that's kind of what IPFS does. IPFS completely removes the need for that middleman. All right. Uh, this is what's called peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, this is kind of how torrent works, uh, where it's all about sending files peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, but I IPFS makes this better in a couple key areas. To understand this, you gotta understand what, how encryption works. All right, so to understand IPFS, we gotta understand what SHA encryption is. How it works is you type in an input, all right, and it gets an output. Now, the important thing to know about this encryption algorithm is the output is randomly different based off the input. What that means is that if I put input, we get this nice, uh, what's called a hash, all right? Uh, now, if I just change one letter, just say, put an A instead of an I, it, it completely changes it and it's to a random extent. So if you had input, there's no way you could understand what the hash for and put would be. Um, and the only, and here's the important thing to understand when it comes to IPFS. This hash right here is unique to this input. No other series of characters will result in this exact output. Uh, and so what this means is that this is like a unique identifier for the, the, sh the hash is a unique identifier for the input. Um, and this is the same type of encryption that encrypts your uh, web traffic with, traffic with HTTPS. This is how, you know, passwords are stored on databases online is that they, they, they're called salting where they encrypt the, the password. How does that have anything to do with IPFS? When you upload a file to IPFS, let's just, uh, that's not the exact how it works, but let's, for the sake of the argument for now, let's, let's say you upload the file, okay? How, what it does is it creates a CID, uh, which is just a content identifier. And what this CID is, it's a hash, uh, just like what we did with the little input example. It's a hash of that file. And so what that means is that, that this CID is unique to that file. And if any changes happen, it completely changes the CID. Why, why is this important? Why is this useful? Why should you care? Well, the important thing is that how many copies of the same file, say, do you have on your, your Google Drive, right? Or exist on the internet as a whole? You know, there's 
uh, if we look at memes or if you look at uh, so much content is replicated, is duplicated, even how uh, like content delivery networks, CDNs work, where they have essentially copies of files all over the place. What IPFS does by hashing these files and having this content identifier scheme is that it completely removes the need for duplication because each file has its own unique hash. How do you, and, now, and there's also a system called IPNS, which enables you to attach a CID to a, an IPNS just stands for an interplanetary name system. So IPNS enables you to tie a, you know, a value to a CID. So that way it makes it a whole lot easier for you to find information um, on IPFS uh, because if your CID changes, like say, and we'll get into this example later, but say, so you want to make a website. Well, you're going to be updating and changing that website. You don't want to have to have a, you know, a new CID and redirect people to the new CID every single time. So instead you use what's called an IPNS and that just uh, directs them to a series of, of CIDs. So that's how that works. How do you actually, how does the peer to peer part work, right? After all, it is a network uh, and networks require multiple people. How the, exactly the algorithm works is a little bit beyond the scope of this video. The, there's a discovery system where when you load up IPFS, it kind of looks for your peers. It has a bootstrap list of you know, people it connects to. This, or, these are like the, the main IPFS nodes and they store information about the nodes that they're connected to. And so as a result, you can kind of uh, fairly quickly map out a fair chunk of the network. So that when you ask for a file, when you say, hey, I want to know what, I want to, I want to find, see if anyone has this MP3 file I upload. You submit that to the network and then everyone asks around and says, kind of like asking, you know, your friend group if, if they know of a good mechanic, right? And someone's like, oh no, I, I know this, I don't know of a good mechanic, but I know this, I have this friend who is in the auto industry and he knows a lot of good mechanics, right? So it's kind of like that where it, it kind of, they kind of figure out who has what file and then they deliver it to you. And that gets into the second part, which is how you actually use IPFS. All right, so there's a multi different, two different main ways of interacting with IPFS. Uh, the first way is by downloading the desktop application from the IPFS website. It should run on most operating systems. You can also use the Brave browser. Uh, Brave has, I, I think maybe Firefox, but I, don't quote me on that. They've integrated IPFS. So you can actually search for IPFS content and on Brave itself. And you can also, you can do much of the same things we're gonna, I'm gonna show you on the desktop app. I like desktop app just because it's, I like the UI, it's clean, it's neat, and it just has, it has a little bit more depth. All right, so that said, when you get here, you're gonna see a couple things. You're gonna see your, you're, you're gonna see your peer ID. You're gonna see bandwidth over time. So this is like incoming versus outcoming traffic. Then there's going to be files. Uh, these are all the files that we've uploaded. We haven't uploaded any, so I'm going to I'm going to upload that really cool photo I found uh, um, in the Obsidian. So, all right, it's imported. Okay. Now, once you upload a file, this is going to be here temporarily. So you know we'll be able to click it, access it. Um, we'll be able to share a link. So we can, I can copy this link, I can send this to somebody and they can punch into their browser and they can pull it up or they can put their hash in the little hash section up there. Um, now, however, this is only gonna be here temporarily. So to make it permanent, what we're gonna do is we're going to set pending. Uh, local node, apply. All right, so now that this file is pinned, as long as this program is up and running, as long as I'm running the IPFS app, and the node is active, people will be able to find and to use this file. Uh, now here's the, here's, the, here's the kind of neat part about IPFS. When you fetch a file or when someone fetches your file, it stores a, it's called seeding, where it stores, temporarily stores a copy of that file on their machine. So when somebody say access, and he wants to access that file and they're, they're searching for, you know, all the nodes are searching for, hey, who has this, uh, this specific CID? They can just go to that peer instead of to you, uh, if, if that's faster. So the more that the file is shared, the faster it becomes. 
the faster the download speeds, the faster people finding it. Um, and so you actually want the, these files to be shared because then it makes it a whole lot faster for other people to find the file, uh, which is a beautiful way of fixing like the scaling issue because typically you're limited, you know, if you're doing the traditional data center approach where you store everything in the cloud, you're limited by bandwidth. You know, like having a lot more traffic is expensive, whereas with IPFS, that completely fixes that problem. All right, so that, those are like the, the main features. You can see, you know, who you're connected to. And of course, the longer this runs, the more people will find. Again, this is as pretty much as easy as it gets, right? If all you want to do is you share a file publicly, you just upload file, upload folder, boom, share the CID and it's ready to go. Now that said, there, there's a couple downsides to understand with IPFS. Uh, the first one is that it's slow. Um, once it took me like five minutes to fully load a high resolution image that a friend sent. If you low latency is an important part of what you're doing, then that, then, you know, IPFS might not be the best solution. Now there are ways around this, of course. You, there are certain services that allow you to pin on other machines. You could set up your own virtual VPS server and, you know, pin a file on, on there. You can, you can get machines, you can hire other people to pin their files on their computers. So that, that makes, that can really speed things up. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's not the point where you, it, as, it is as fast as, you know, using a browser. Now, and if you want to transport sensitive information, you're, what you're going to want to do is you're going to encrypt the file, obviously, right? You're going to want to encrypt it with a password, you're going to want to encrypt it with a key, and then share that key with a person that you're sending it to. Um, because again, this is all public, publicly accessible. So if they have your hash, your CID, then they will be able to find your file. The, the other downside is if you're storing like user data or if you want to take something down, it's nearly impossible if other people have pinned it. So like, for example, this picture right here, I'm pretty confident that once I unpin it, uh, nothing's going to happen. I haven't shared this with anyone. And by the time this video comes up, uh, it's going to be taken down. It's not going <laughs> to actually probably, um, you know, it's not going to exist anymore. I'm pretty confident about that, right? However, if, you know, say you, you're sharing a public piece of content with somebody and they pin that file, they store it, they pin it, there's nothing you can do to take that file down. Which, again, it's a feature and it's a bug. It's a feature because this gets around censorship. This is getting used multiple times to get through the Chinese firewall. Uh, it's incredibly powerful, but once you post it, right, and if you share it, if people know about it and, you know, they save it and they store it, then there's nothing you can do to take that information. So there's something to keep in mind when you're when you're dealing with this. All right, use cases. So a uh, huge use case is websites uh, slash apps. Uh, now, you gotta be careful if you're collecting user data and you're storing user data on IPFS. That can be an issue because for the aforementioned reason, you can't remove the data, so that might, <clears throat> or might violate some GDPR regulations. Uh, however, if you just want a basic static HTML website, uh, you can easily create and share it. Again, it, it's very slow to load web pages and to get, fetch content, um, but it is possible. It, it's a really neat, it's a neat way to create decentralized, you know, unstoppable websites. Um, the next is sharing sensitive information. I can, I can spell uh, information. There we go. Uh, sharing sensitive information. So if you want to share a file that government won't be happy about, then you could use this to IPFS to, to share that uh, if you're afraid of being censored. So if you're a journalist, if you're you know, running, running a business and you don't trust, maybe you're, you're, you're sending some, some information you, wouldn't, you aren't comfortable storing on the crowd storing on the cloud, then you could use IPFS to share that. Of course, you'd also make sure in that case to obviously encrypt the file when you send it. Um, but again, that could be another powerful use case. My personal favorite is NFTs. Okay. Uh, issue with NFTs is that NFTs are, the, the actual images or the files that they're referencing are, most of them are stored on AWS, like OpenSea is just, it's storing on AWS, right? So you have all the same issues that the old internet has. IPFS completely changes this. Here's why. So say you get an NFT that references a site CID. What that means is a couple things. First of all, 
no one can change that image. No one, because if they change that image, it's going to be a completely different CID. So even if they change one pixel, it's going to be entirely different. That's not the case with OpenSea. Uh, you know, theoretically, it is possible someone could change the image, change what you actually got. Other thing is that you don't have to be reliant on the, you know, the NFT provider, if you will, marketplace or creator to store that file because once they create it, they reference the, the CID, you can just fetch it and pin it on your own machine. So now you're in charge of your own NFT. It greatly increases longevity and the usefulness of that NFT. Here are some awesome resources that I were definitely worth checking out. So uh, the first one is uh, just their web page, ipfs.tech. There's a lot of good information, kind of like how it works. You can install the uh, desktop, you can install the command line. Uh, there's just a whole lot of uh, great information on the site. Second place is the docs. Fairly easy to read. They kind of go over a lot of the basic stuff. They go into much more detail than uh, in this video. And I highly encourage you, if this is something you're interested in, to read the docs and really understand how this works. So one is the ecosystem directory. This just shows you the different projects that are using IPFS and it, it might jog your memory as far as, not, not jog your memory, give you some ideas, inspire you. Uh, I know it has me. Uh, and finally, we've got awesome IPFS. These, this is a list of apps um, and tools that you can use. I've had a lot of fun kind of going through these. There's like file encryptors, there's, it's a great resource to, to dive deeper. Anyways, I hope this was a useful tutorial. You found it, um, you're able to get inspired, maybe learn a little bit more about it. If you are, um, if you're in this space, if you're a business owner, if you are just interested in learning more about different projects happening in this space, I'll be planning on rolling out more content, kind of like this, basic tutorial videos, kind of give you a high level view of how some of these projects work. Because, I mean, Crypto Web 3 right now suffers from the issue of there being a lot of really powerful tech, but not many people know about it or know how to use it. And so uh, that's kind of what we're here to do. So anyways, I'll uh, see you guys in the next video.